Uh, today is class three tech ethics. So let me um, start the slide deck. Uh, I think that, uh, so at a high level, as a reminder, we chatted about this at the end last time, um, tech ethics is uh, in the context of um, other, uh, the other parts of this class, which are the financial ethics piece, um, aka viewing cryptocurrencies as uh, money, and then, and that'll be next class, and then the class after that, class five, is institutional ethics. Uh, so viewing these cryptocurrency and blockchain networks as a new kind of institution. Um, so today we're looking at tech ethics. And I just want to, uh, and Neha and I were actually chatting about this when we were talking about the class um, earlier. The, the words like tech ethics and blockchain ethics are kind of um, uh, misleading because you think that you're going to come in and like, understand ethics in this deep way and like understand like philosophers like Aristotle and how they think about ethics and like what is right, what is wrong and those kinds of things and like these abstract notions of what we should do. And there's, there's some of that in, in the tech ethics world, but really it looks a lot more like this, um, which is kind of these three pieces where you understand these complex socio-technical systems that we live in where you have technology and how that interacts with economics and policy and culture and all those reinforcing feedback loops. And then from there, you kind of look at the impacts and you say, oh, ugh, there's this thing that we're creating that might be super good or that might be super bad. Um, and uh, so then you look at these impacts and then once you see those impacts, you say, oh, how can we actually intervene in this complex system? Uh, and again, that involves a bunch of these different levers that you can pull. Um, so that's really what tech ethics is, and like the, the ethics part of it, if you want to be more specific, like sometimes the ethical piece is helpful here for determining impacts, for saying like, okay, which things should we prioritize over other things? Or is like a right to privacy more important than like the consequences of that privacy? Right? So you can kind of do some balancing with the ethics here, um, but really this is, is how I think about it. Um, and with that said, that's essentially the, the focus and the outline of today's class. So we're going to look and uh, understand the technical system, kind of building on what Neha did last class. Um, we're gonna explore some of the positive and negative impacts, and then we'll do that kind of as a class in an interactive way. Uh, and then we'll kind of look at how to intervene in these systems. And especially there's this like cat and mouse game that we'll explore um, that was kind of in the readings. Uh, and then finally at the end, we'll look at some uh, other ethical framings if we yeah, so today let's start with this understanding the technical system piece. Um, so we can think of it as, and we'll kind of digest each of these, but um, we can think of blockchain technology as this immutable distributed database that uses cryptography for consent and pseudonymity. And again, that's a super hard word to say. Um, and then it uses protocols and decentralization for this unstoppable code. Uh, so we'll kind of explore each of these, what they mean. So this, as a reminder, this immutable distributed database, um, you can think of most databases like this, where you have a centralized ledger and everything is kept, uh, you keep track of things on that ledger, the bank keeps track of transactions, um, and everybody kind of talks to that main ledger, versus a distributed database where everybody has a copy of the ledger and is running the copy of the ledger. So that's what we mean by distributed database and by immutable, and again, this is one of those binary words that we should be like, is it actually immutable? Um, we kind of mean uh, what Neho was saying with tamper proof, where it's hard to- Resistant, she said. Tamper she resistant, resistant, you're right. Proof is another <laughs> binary word. Tamper resistant, append generally instead of append <laughs> only. Um, but I think it is actually append only. Um, and uh, this is an image from her last thing of, you have this series of blocks that goes forward into time, and it's very hard um, both from a cryptographic perspective and from a economic incentive perspective to um, adjust old blocks in the chain um, because so much has been built on top of that old block and so you have to only add to the end. So that's what we mean by this immutable distributed database. Uh, and that thing, uh, it uses, uh, as you start to use it, it uses cryptography for con consent and pseudonymity. So, um, this is the cryptography for consent. What we mean by that is this public private key pair that Neha was referencing last time, where you have 
Um, you essentially generate a public and private key through mathematical uh, magic. Um, the private key is kind of like your password. It allows you to spend these Bitcoins and only you know it, like don't tell it to people, that's why it's private. Um, and then the public key is connected to that and it's kind of like your email address or what have you and allows you to receive Bitcoins. So people can send them essentially to your public key um, and then you can spend them with your private key. Uh, and so this system is, uh, cryptography is what underlies this system and allows the private key uh, to be connected to the public key in this way. Um, so that's what it means by consent is that only I can spend the money from my private key. Um, and then cryptography is also part of this pseudonymity piece uh, where instead of the database um, saying, you know, from Reese to Nathan and from Nathan to Natalia, it has, so this is just a picture from the blockchain recently, um, from the Bitcoin blockchain, where it has this random long series of, you know, numbers and letters sending to this random long series of numbers and letters. So when you look at this, it's not necessarily clear who um, is sending and receiving these transactions. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of redundancy. Uh, but there's a lot of redundancy. The as last in, two come from the same ooh, yes, exactly. source address, which is not even a thing. Send the same to two of the same addresses. Yeah. Um, is there another same address? There's a lot of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the third, the, the third from the bottom. This one change address that's identical to the full sending address. Oh. Fourth from the bottom has the same, and the fifth yep. has the three. Yeah. yeah there's the five, it's, <laughs> it's sad. <laughs> you can see how much quicker he can read. So what he was saying was that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's just like you you work to. Hopefully, it is pseudonymous because people don't do this, but everyone does this. And you can't enforce, it's decentralized, so you can't. You can tell people, hey, don't do this. You're reducing your privacy. And when you reduce your own privacy, you reduce everyone's privacy. But yeah, that's still what happens today. Yeah, so what Taj is saying is that this one, this sending address, it was sent to both the same original address, so these are the same things, this 16F thing, and a new address. Um, and then he was also saying that these two are the same sending address. And so these are kind of in the reading about um, looking at, it was called like cookies on the blockchain or have you web payments. It looks at things like this where you can kind of group things together and start to, at the, at the beginning, it looks pseudonymous. You're like, oh, I can't really tell what the hell's going on. Therefore, this is private. Um, but uh, in reality, what you can do is connect these things in a variety of ways. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's the pseudonymity piece which is not full anonymity. Um, and so, and, and to be clear on that, let me say one final thing, which is pseudonymity means that you have a, uh, it's not your traditional identif identifier uh, that you're using as an identifier, but it is, uh, but it is still an identifier, I guess is the way to think about it. Um, so it's not like my name or my email address or whatever, but it's this weird thing that looks gobbledygooky from our perspective, but in fact, uh, if you try hard enough, generally you can connect it back to a real identifier. Um, so that's the cryptography piece, so it's the consent allowing you to spend um, with the private key and then the pseudonymity on the blockchain itself, the transactions. Um, and then there's the the protocols for decentralization, or protocols and decentralization for unstoppable code. So this one has a little bit more in it. Um, so what do we mean by unstoppable code? Uh, there's no real like definition of this, but uh, it is unstoppable code is code that is difficult for adversaries to stop the execution of on a global network. So you have some code, some kind of thing, whether it's a transaction or a piece of code that you want to run, and it's difficult for Whoever wants to stop you, to stop. That's why they call it unstoppable. Um, and uh, yes, this is what, when people talk about censorship resistant or censorship proof, uh, that's kind of what they're getting at, is that the code is, um, is unstoppable. Uh, so let's look at how this actually works. So when we talk about a protocol, um, I think about a protocol, and this is a, it's just a definition from Wikipedia, it's a system of rules uh, that allows two plus entities of a communication system to transmit information. So that means that you have a, a system of rules and you have a variety of entities and it's essentially just a language that they use to talk to each other. 
Um, you could think of English as a protocol for like humans. Humans are talking with each other in English, and I, you know what I'm saying because we've been you know, born and raised with this stuff or what have you. Protocol is like that, but for computers, where you say, okay, these computers in this network kind of want to talk to each other. What's the shared language that they all have? What's the shared protocol that they have that allows them to transmit information to each other? Um, and what this does, this, this system of rules, um, and we'll look at it uh, with the internet stack in a second, but it allows for permissionlessness and trustlessness. Um, and what we mean by that is if you have, just like it would be very hard to stop someone from speaking English or like trying to learn English or something like that, it's also hard to stop people from using these protocols because they're just a set of rules and you can just start using them uh, in a way that doesn't require people's permission and may not require something like trust to, to get into that system. Um, so that's what we mean by protocol. And these protocols were a big part of the internet stack. This is kind of a funny thing, but like the internet stack was created in like the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And um, we don't really think about it very much at all. We only think about the applications that are built on top of it. But in fact, there are um, these protocols that are part of the internet stack. Uh, and so I really, I don't actually know what the, this link Ethernet protocol. And Ethernet address is a specific hardware address that's like tied to it. It's your MAC address. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So this, so this is to say, it's a the set of rules such that when there are, and I didn't know that that set set when there are collisions and things, mm -hmm. how should we deal with those collisions? Um, and then stuff like this TCP/IP piece is when you think about your IP address, the like series of numbers that has like. 22.85. whatever. Um, that is a set of, again, a protocol, a set of rules or language for saying, okay, I want to talk to someone else on the internet. Oh, I'm going to type in their little blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 and the internet will find them because it knows the kind of the protocol or the rules to find them. And then on top of that, you have like the application layer, and there's this one, this SMTP, which stands for Simple Mail Transport Protocol. Um, and so that's kind of what all email is built on top of. So it's a protocol for saying, hey, how can we give and receive emails from each other, blah, blah, blah. And then something like Yahoo back in the day or uh, Gmail or Outlook kind of uses that protocol and puts a user experience and a UI on top of it. Um, so, yeah, this is... But, but you're not saying that they are unstoppable code, right? I would say, um, so I would, pr I would say that they are in... in so I would say pretty much yes, they are unstoppable code um, in the sense that when the early internet came out, um, people were, you could give and receive any kind of bytes over the internet to anybody else that was connected to the network. And um, you could do it in a way that was very permissionless. And so people were, there was an unstoppability there and a, um, a I think of this in a little, I think of this in a little bit of a different way. These are peer-to-peer -peer protocols. It's two people talking to each other. Um, and maybe it's many different people talking to each other forming a network. But you know, you can't really get in the middle of that peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Like if Reese and I want to go off and and speak SMTP to each other <laughs> yeah, you know, in the corner of a room, that's totally, you know, th there isn't really a way to get in the middle of that or even necessarily to know that it's happening. Um, when I think when Reese is going to get into unstoppable code, we'll see that it's a little bit different than just peer-to-peer. -peer. But we haven't gotten there yet. And I, I kind of agree, but I think that there's a, I think the biggest difference, honestly, is that or one of the biggest differences is what you're able to transmit when you're in one of these networks. Because back in the day, the things that you were able to transmit were just the information. And now, with something like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, you're able to transmit value in a permissionless way. Uh, so I think that is the one of the primary uh, differences between the early internet stack and uh, the currently building uh, blockchain stack. Does that help? Well, I, I just think it matters because we're, we're going to get to one of the arguments, you know, that unstoppable code is nothing new because we already have it, right? Mm -hmm. But the, but the, I mean, we have lots of ways of entering legally into this, intervening, and, and holding people uh, liable. Totally. So. Yeah, I think that... Um, if I understand your point correctly, it's and you can you can uh, 
yes, that for this system, now we have a bunch of rules uh, in place and laws in place that allow us to uh, regulate what was at the beginning right. an emergent, exactly. unstoppable code yes, exactly. permissionless network. Yeah. And then over time, you have things like you know, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or whatever, yeah. which was like, hey, yeah. you can't actually share, um, you know, you, you, uh, you have to put these these barriers around copyrights and things like that. So yeah, um, and we haven't seen as much of those these days with the cryptocurrency world. But I would point out these protocols are just languages, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing in the language that implements the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, mm -hmm. right? That's not at that level. It's, it's at a much higher level. And these protocols- What, what is at a much higher level? laws and where those laws are regulated. They're not regulated inside the protocol no. No. Yeah, okay. so yeah, I think it's yeah, very yeah, key. Yeah, yeah. Also, these protocols together, the, the protocols are independent of the system in which they're implemented. The internet as we know it right now is a system, there's a internet that implement that uses these protocols. You can make another parallel internet that also uses these protocols. The protocols are not specific to the internet that we know and use. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I, I was really um, ruffled when you first asked your question, like, uh, sorry, technical person here, know all about like the transport layer and networks. Um, and I was seeing this as like plumbing and uh, like the, the unstoppable code is written as like logic on top of, uh, like this isn't about logic. Um, but then I, I think you raise a really good point of like the unstoppable code on the ethernet system or that's like a network system that is assuming that like people have like bought into that network and then that's when the unstoppable code is relevant and it's only when you've bought into like the using HTTP and that's when HTTP is a big ubiquitous that sending um, something that's copyright over HTTP requires law. That's what I feel like you actually exactly. brought up yeah. a really yeah, exactly. interesting exactly. point that I would have waved off. So if I understand correctly, the uh, what you that. This is plumbing, like there's no there's no like unstoppable code when we're looking at just the internet stack doesn't really make sense since it's not like anyone's like encoding any logic into like the plumbing that sends one thing from here to there mm -hmm. um, versus like the unstoppable code that um, in, like encapsulates logic yeah. um, in like an, in a smart contract. Yeah. Um, but like the smart contracts are only like relevant, the unstoppable code is only relevant after we've like bought into the Ethernet system and it's like this ubiquitous system and like sending something that is copyright over HTTP is only like problematic or requires law after uh, like using HTTP is ubiquitous. So, so you could say that, that CCIP is written by coders and, and, and you could transport it use somewhere else. But what we have now is, a, is an ecosystem that uses TCP IP, but it also uses a whole slew of, of legislation that placed it as the central uh, way of, it's, it's an historically grown ecosystem that includes not just the code, but a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when, if we come to that point where we, we're gonna say, now we have this unstoppable code, that stuff there, and so there's nothing new in the unstoppable code. It's, you know, you're not, you're not arguing straight that way. And we saw that in some of the reading where, where the, you know. Uh, Jason. Yeah, so I would like to argue one of the key differences here is whether or not uh, state and history is maintained or shared state and history. That one, one of the crucial aspects of this notion of unstoppable code is anyone can run it. That is here. Uh, so in some sense, like anyone can use these languages or do protocols, say on the Bitcoin. One of the important differences when looking at Bitcoin is this also maintains a shared history over a whole bunch of different computations. In that way, I would say like conceptually, this entire stack building the internet generates a body that looks kind of like this incomparable code because you have a whole bunch of computers that are able to communicate and maintain some sort of state and transfer some sort of information. Um, and that these protocols individually should be thought of possibly as categorically different because uh, they're limited in what they can do in a way that we seem to want, we seem to be wanting to make a distinction. I, I want to make sure we have enough time. Yeah, I think so. I think, we haven't even yeah, gotten to this. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, this is, these are some things that we're going to discuss later. I think my 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 takeaways would be when we are uh, in general, we're going to be doing a lot of mappings in this class, where we map something like early internet 
um, uh, protocols to these current blockchain protocols and then trying to determine where the mapping is true and where it's not true. Uh, and we'll do similar things with like money as well and being like, oh, how are these you know, tokens similar or different from um, these existing systems? Uh, and I think that the, yeah, and so we can, we can debate how much, um, how, how we should think about that mapping between these uh, in initial permissionless protocols and the current ones that are being built. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, I think we'll do that more at the end of the class today. So in any case, this is how the internet stack works. You have these, um, uh, this is, um, when you think about it, we mostly see all the application layer here, but there's this protocol layer underneath with these things, um, Gmail, et cetera, built on top. And I do think it's an important distinction as well to um, clarify between what a platform is versus a protocol. And so a platform are these things like Google and Facebook and Uber and Airbnb, and they also have kind of their rules and their language for talking with each other in the system. Um, but uh, they set the rules, right? That they being the company sets the rules. How does Airbnb, um, you know, how do people give stars to each other? How do you match? people on Uber, et cetera. Um, and so it's not as permissionless. You need to go into, uh, you know, for something like Uber, you need to make sure you go through their driver's license system or whatever to, to access it. That's different than the protocol, which again is a series of language and a set of rules. Um, but uh, in terms of who sets the rules, it's usually more of like a nonprofit, like, or, or a weird like government consortium, like the W3C. Um, and so it's more, and the, and the system, when it gets created, it's permissionless, so it doesn't require the uh, check off of some of these uh, big players here. So that's the difference between these platforms and protocols. Um, and when you think about Bitcoin as a protocol, uh, yeah, I mean, it has all of these, uh, you know, different rules for how the, the network works, for how the nodes talk to each other, for how the miners, how they mine in the system and get. Um, uh, and, and get money from the system and, and produce blocks. Uh, it has these rules for spending that you know you have to have your private key and you can't spend your coins more than once and you need to send to a correctly formed address and um, and so this as a you know you can view Bitcoin as a protocol um, here and these new uh, if you want to you can then go further and think about things like smart contracts or other things as additions to this protocol stack. Um, and again, I think that the crucial difference here is that um, these are all protocols for information sending, while this is a protocol for uh, sending value. Um, so that's the protocol perspective. Uh, and this, the permissionlessness and trustlessness uh, kind of lends itself to decentralization. Uh, so what we mean by here is like, you have um, something that's permissionless that has a set of rules that just allow you to interact with that system, and therefore you have kind of this lower barrier to entry. Um, and what that lends itself to is something like this, where you have, these are, um, this is like a heat map of all the different Bitcoin nodes in the world. I think they're like about 10,000 right now. So these are people that are running the Bitcoin software on a computer or a server somewhere. Um, and because uh, everybody talks in the same way to each other through the protocol, you can have this big uh, permissionless decentralized network um, here. And a similar thing also happens for Bitcoin miners, where again, it's just a set of rules for how one would Bitcoin mine. Um, this has been, and I guess this graph is uh, just showing like how different, you know, the blue dots are the major regions where Bitcoin miners are and the um, black dots are minor, uh, minor uh, reasons, <laughs> uh, regions uh, where the um, miners are. So this is, a, um, and I don't know how, I don't know how many there are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> less than nodes, but still a lot. Um, it depends so, on how you define, how you define yeah, one, yeah, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> um, so that is what we mean by decentralization, is that the permissionlessness and the protocol allows for a lot of different <clears throat> um, uh, folks in the network to talk to each other. Um, and so this is kind of the full setup here, is you have this, Immutable distributed database um, that has the uses the cryptography for the consent and the pseudonymity, um, and then it has these protocols and decentralization that creates this feeling of unstoppable code, which we'll go into right now. So, the unstop. Let, yeah, let me pause for a quick second before going to that. Are there any questions on um, on this piece here? Clarifying questions or comments on that? So, 
strikes me is, um, in terms of this permission permissionless, you might want to split it up into both the tech and social aspects. Uh, because I feel like those were conflated in the prior slide, yeah. which is both from the technology standpoint, you can have something that's on the extreme private end, such as some other company runs it for you and literally you have no, no way to access that technologically, um, versus you know, software that you can run on your own machine and maybe even change, and versus the social aspect uh, of whether it's permissioned, which is like, do I have a legal mandate to go after you if you run my code, uh, versus, like, is this just a protocol that's open to everyone that anyone can use? Mm -hmm. um, so if I understand that correctly, yeah, you're saying that permissionlessness is uh, contextualized from a technical perspective where you can say, hey, how can one access, uh, uh, you know, you, does one need per, um, per technical permissions to access this network versus a social perspective, which is more from like uh, thinking about like the legal nation state that you're in, is, is that correct? Okay, so, yeah. so both like corporation and private entities could build things that are technologically or socially permissioned or permissionless. Mm -hmm. Like they can contribute to this open source project, or they can have uh, have their own code that you're not allowed to copy, but you could view. Versus uh, technology that literally you don't know how to to access or understand. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, like governmental or non-governmental organization could also fall into any of these categories. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I generally agree with that. And I think that that maps relatively well into the, uh, this, um, uh, yeah, these different sets here of when you're talking about any given thing, you say, hey, is that operating in the technological realm or like the policy realm or what have you? And I would also say that one other quick note here is like, yeah, the permissionlessness, a crucial thing that people talk about here is a permissionless network and how, and people say, hey, it's totally democratized, anybody can access it, but then there's questions of, um, is, can anybody actually access it, can you understand the technology, things like that. Um, so, yeah, let's do one Sorry, more. Sorry, but the, the, the Facebook page, you know, where you said they basically decide, Yeah. and I, I, I just, I, I, it really, I, it rubs me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's, it's partly um, because it's, it, it makes it much easier to 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 demonize them, uh, and and certainly the Andreas piece is you know is very demonizing with stuff like this. But you but you started with the four dot things, but we should really look at the, the many different uh, uh, things that come together. There is so much stuff that's going on that is not just decision making inside Facebook, right? I mean, just look at the the reaction that is happening now. Uh, something like GDPR has a huge impact on what what these. So it's it's really not good to write that they set the rules. I, 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 it, it, yeah, it, it, it sets up a conversation that is that is wrong. I think. But they did set the rules for the GDPR thing, right? Look, if we can go back to the four dots thing, you know, these these are not entities that decide everything by themselves. They're, they're just not. They have to. They have to function in society. If you, if you could bring up the, the four dots uh, thing that you say is, is central to, to, to this course, yeah. right? That is the issue here. I think that's right. what we should be talking about. I think you're right. I think that, that specific statement was, that statement was specific to the technology part of the dots. I, I don't think they are. Think they can't be separated? Not, they can, yeah. No. Yeah. Mm. I think, I guess, the differentiation that people are making here is, yeah, when we think about um, something like for this, uh, this differentiation between a platform and a protocol, a, this is generally scoped to the technology piece where you say, okay, when you're, deter when you're building the technology, um, in the end, to some extent, um, you know, Facebook or Google or Uber, they set the rules, they're the ones who have push access to their repos there. Um, and what Arne is saying as well is that, well, obviously they're part of this big socio-technical system that's part of markets and norms and laws, that also impacts them. I think that the crucial piece though here is, I just want to, at least for me personally, when initially learning about the difference between platforms and protocols, I think that that differentiation is a crucial one. And I think that, that, um, that this slide is primarily just trying to say the difference between these big web 2.0 platforms and how they operate from a technical perspective. And then some of these protocols that were built in the early internet and protocols that are starting to be built now that are um, that are operate more from a protocol perspective. 
apologies. No, no, I mean, you can you be angry as allowed. Um, so, um, <laughs> sweet. so let's talk about, let's go through a specific example here of um, if we wanted to send someone like WikiLeaks money. Um, so I guess the first question I'd want to ask you all is, can you imagine, like, uh, let's, why could it be the case that we couldn't send WikiLeaks money? What could have happened to them such that I can't just send them money in a normal way? Really far away. That's an interesting. Bank, bank accounts account. got freezed. Yeah. There are bank accounts got freezed. What did you say? That's it. Yeah. Or I don't know their bank accounts. Well, someone would get really mad at me if I sent them money. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't have money. I don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pre-problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think all of those are true. And I think the one that we want to hit on here was the bank accounts being freezed piece. Or, and this happened in um, two WikiLeaks in 2012, I believe, for two years. Um, it was it was less than, or I, I couldn't dive into it too deep, but Visa and MasterCard and PayPal, and a bunch of people were saying, we will not um, send you money and we will not. I don't know if it was how much it was the banks and how much it was the credit card companies, but it was very hard for a bit to send um, WikiLeaks money over a traditional like credit card or PayPal or the internet thing. Um, and so, if you wanted to send them money back at this time, and you can go and you could say, they have a button at the bottom that says, donate in other ways. Um, and you can donate with uh, something like Bitcoin. So let's look at how that would work. Um, so, uh, you go and you create your wallet, which is your public-private key pair, and they also do the same thing. Um, we somehow get money, and I somehow get money into this wallet, we can talk about that. Uh, in a bit and how that works to go from the US financial system into the, um, uh, the Bitcoin world. But once I have those Bitcoins um, in my private key, then what they do is they would like generate one of these addresses and they would say, okay, here's, here's my address. You can go and you can send to it. Um, and then I uh, would then, you know, with my private key, sign it um, and send it to that address, put, a, put some BTC, uh, put, put, uh, put their address here um, and then it would, you know, that transaction would get added to this block um, and that, you know, some or one of these miners would be looking at all the new transactions that exist. They would have completed this weird math puzzle that we haven't talked too much about in class. Um, and they have then been able to get the opportunity to add a bunch of transactions to a block and they do so. Um, and once it gets added to a new block, it gets added to the blockchain. Um, and then that new block is kind of propagated into the network. Um, so that's how something like this would work. And then WikiLeaks gets their money, uh, and then they, again, have to deal with that awkward last piece, which is, okay, now they have the Bitcoin, how do they turn it into uh, wherever Julian Assange lives? Um, to, be, to be clear, yeah. what happens is WikiLeaks observes that the public key associated with their private key, had, there's a transaction sending to that public key, which means their private key can now be used to spend that money. So it's not like something's actually sent to WikiLeaks, to be clear. It's the mere fact that this has appeared in the ledger and they know that they have the ability to spend it is the end of is, is the transaction. Yeah, so that's a clear, which is, it goes from one address to the other address and that new address is connected to the WikiLeaks private key, essentially. And so now they have the ability to spend it where before when it was connected to my private key, I didn't have, or uh, only I had the ability to spend it and they did not. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, hello, person in the back. Do you want to say your name and who you are? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Ryan Chang from City Finance Group. Pleased to be here. Cool. Welcome. Um, we're talking about sending WikiLeaks money over the internet with Bitcoin. Um, I, I encouraged him to come because his thesis or his uh, PhD is about local token economies. Oh, that's great. Um, Sorry, I'm no, that's okay. Thank you for coming. Uh, those are those are interesting. Um, thank you for encouraging him to come. Uh, so, as you can see here, the different pieces of that um, that piece where we have the cryptography and then we have the, the protocol for determining which address and how you send it to it, and then you have these decentralization pieces um, that make it so that uh, it gets added by a random you know miner and it gets added and then it gets propagated through the network. So, that's how we would send WikiLeaks money. And what I want to do now is, we're gonna talk a bit in a second about how 
if you were like a nation state actor, like a regulatory body, how you would attack this and how you would say, okay, I want to make it the case that WikiLeaks can't actually get this money. There's a lot of different ways to kind of attack that here. Um, but before I do that, what I want to do is look at, essentially what I want to do is look at how, um, given these things that we just looked at, the database piece, the cryptography piece, the protocols and decentralization piece, um, let, I want to, we're going to break into group, or sorry, we're, first we're going to do this individually, um, and to, for yourself to think about, okay, what are some of the positive uh, impacts of this, and what are some of the negative impacts of this? So you're thinking from like a social impact, social good perspective, you're essentially thinking about that, if you think back to my, that first thing with the smiley face and the frowny face, you're essentially writing down, what are the smiley faces of this? Why is this good for the world? and also the frowny face and be like, Ugh, how could this be bad? Um, and then we'll get together in groups and share them uh, and then share them with the club. Okay. So uh, let's have the people share what they learned and maybe the best thing to say is like, here's the things we talked about on the positive side, here are the things we talked about on the negative side and I'll kind of write them up on the board. Uh, so let's start right here. Okay, so... I just want to remind everybody your name at the beginning. Just Great. So I'm Natalia and what do you say your name? Uh, Lucas. Thank you. Um, and so for our positives, we had that in general, a distributive system is more shock resistant in terms of protection from calamities, natural disasters, like if something happened in one area, like the system still runs. The second is because of pseudonymity, um, if needed, you can actually trace back any sort of like, um, point in the system where there might be like a hack or something like that, or if you need to like find the bad guy, like there's a, the ability to trace back somewhat, um, or to look for discrepancies in the public blockchain in terms of, oh, like this seems suspicious activity. So that's the second one. The third positive we had was this idea of like smart contracts and making things more automated away from human error. Um, and then the fourth one was this idea of for people that live in governments that are corrupt, like having like, there's like government, like censorship kind of. Um, and then on the negative side, um, we said for the data in the systems, like garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by garbage in, garbage So out? like if there's code running on, like running, or like if there's data input into the system that is like altered or like not true or something, that is continually built on, built on within the blockchain system, like that, okay, well, you can go back and change that data and like other people might take it for truth. Um, and then the second negative is this idea that I think like was kind of brought up in the reading around like social media versus like this unstoppable code problem. So thinking about, okay, an unstoppable code, you have no sort of real time or retroactive control um, versus even in social media, like it's an open platform where people can say what they want, but still, you know, like Facebook and Google can say like, okay, either real time or retroactively, we can like go and take down like things that are actually dangerous to other people versus here, there's just no real time or retro retroactive, retroactive control at all. It has to be proactive, in which case, are we even like, do we even have a decentralized system at all then if it's proactively kind of tampered with? Yeah. Yeah, cool. I like a lot of those. Uh, next group. Is this on the plus? Or a plus and minus. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so on the pure plus side, we said you can make public immutable commitments. Uh, so for example, I'm going to do the scientific experiment, and here's my data, and then here's my analysis. Um, or I'm going to make binding political commitments, or other things like that. Um, also, it potentially provides uh, audible markets or other sorts of exchange of information. On the plus and minus side, it provides uh, secure, difficult to disrupt, uh, censorship resistant markets, which is good for good markets and maybe bad for noxious markets. Um, similarly, it provides secure, censorship resistant communication, which is maybe good for um, human rights, GPTQ information, or bad for, say, bioweapons manufacturing information. And um, on the 
the plus side, assuming you think the system is good in general, it's uh, um, it's resilient. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Good. Uh, thank you. Let's go over here. So uh, for um, we, we put black ignorance is for anonymity as a negative. And kind of what we we'll talked about earlier today. If you don't know the implications, then like it's not beneficial. Um, we put transparency is a good thing. You know, you can't re you know uh, read the negative on a deal. Um, and uh, you know, like dependent on third parties. Uh, but on like uh, a negative, it's like the right to be forgotten. Like if something's on the ledger, it can't be forgotten. If for some reason you want to be forgotten, it's not possible. <laughs> Um, and then also, we we kind of been we didn't decide on a positive whether it was positive or negative, but like you know, like the lack of censorship. Uh, so depending on how you view things, is either of the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's go to this group. Oh. Um, what did we say? We said bad things more than good things. Um, <laughs> the two I think interesting bad ones. So one is it's easy to screw up and there's no undo button. So like you can screw up and lose things and that's annoying. Um, I think an interesting one that's negative, I don't think people mentioned is it's really hard to understand. And so because of that, you end up getting a lot of sort of scams and snake oil salesmen and stuff. And then that ends up ripping a lot of people off because they see that there's utility and they're like, hey, there's these cool new things that are unstoppable and distributed and things. And then so people say, oh, I've got you know IOTA, and you should use it because it's trinary. And then they get lots of money from people, but they they're not actually any of those uh, cool things. So so and and a, a lot of it's because like nobody understands all these things that well. And so when you're you're presented a, a good pitch of how powerful this new system is, a lot of times you're like, yeah, take my money. So yeah, it's hard to understand. Good, thank you. And then let's go to final group. We had a lot of the things that are already on the board, such as censorship resistance, and again, we were unclear on whether that was always good or bad, um, maybe neither. Uh, the ones that aren't already on the board, uh, no customer support, thought that was maybe problematic. Um, it undermines banks, which can be both good and bad, and institutions as a whole. Um, it's difficult to tax, which could be bad if you're trying to increase equity. Uh, it's a global system it, that doesn't look at geographic boundaries, so sending to a neighbor could be as costly as sending a proxy, which could increase equity. I think those were the main high availability. I guess that was touched upon already. I think those are the things that haven't already been mentioned, what do you think? Oops. Yeah. Good, yeah, so I think that this list, um, thank you all, I think this list is similar, and we'll see in a second, I have a pretty similar-ish list around, um, yeah, there's the shock resistant, resilience, um, the availability piece that, that uh, uh, Alex just mentioned, there's all the immutability pieces and how it, it's, it's, when you can't reverse some of these things, that, um, makes it more awkward if you if you mess up, um, and uh, and then it also has obviously the ability to trace back um, affects that, uh, and then there's all the piece around the going around corrupt governments, these censorship resistant things, and these immutable markets that just or that just run um, versus that undermining some things like banks or making it hard to tax or something like that, which may be bad for equity. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I think yeah, those two interesting ones about the um, and hard this thing in the technology that's hard to understand, um, and so people can sell each other snake oil and things like that. Uh, and then also the interesting one about global uh, something being a because it is global, it is both good because you can send money around the world at possibly lower transaction costs, but to um, send it to your neighbor or whatever uh, might be high. So there's kind of a, a plus negative there. Um, so let me show the ones I have here and then we can discuss any other final pieces of this. Um, yeah, so I kind of, I personally just broke it up into for each kind of technical affordance, which uh, things, uh, which, what are the positive social impacts and negative. There are lots of things that you all said here, here the definitive source of truth versus like you can't go back, the immutableness. This is the resilience piece that a lot of you talked about, but 
these things can be like the duplication and inefficiency in these systems um, is something that's talked about a good amount. It's like how many uh, you know Bitcoin nodes should there be, um, and uh, how much duplication should you have if you want to have a resilient system. Um, so that's kind of on the the negative side of this. And like I think um, Dylan was saying in that corner, a lot of them are kind of dichotomies or things that are can be positive in one, and what a lot of you said, which are things can be positive in one light, then negative in the other light. So all of these are essentially, mm -hmm. you know, positive maps and negative maps as well. Um, so on this side, on the cryptography side, of course, the, um, yeah, this, this asset uh, that strong actors can't take uh, this, in what people often say something like a right to transact. Um, like I have a right to X, Y, Z, I have a right to privacy, I have a right to transact. Um, Something that you all didn't talk about uh, that is kind of interesting is that it's easier to extort in a, in a way. Or like, if you try to extort me, if you say, hey, Reese, give me your money from Wells Fargo or whatever, and you like get me in or kidnap me and put me in a room, um, and then I give you my Wells Fargo stuff, or whatever, then like later I can like get that money back and can like cancel those transactions or something. But in this, it's like, if someone like gets my private key, that, then there's my money. Um, and I have been hacked, by the way. <laughs> and I had no money, so they were sad. Um, <laughs> honestly, I, they sent an email from my email to my email that said, LOL, you're poor. Um, <laughs> um, with some other, ex, uh, you know, um, cuss words. Um, yeah, they were mean. Um, <laughs> uh, so in any case, easier-ish to extort. Um, on the positive side, yeah, the pseudonymity, it provides some, this is something that we didn't talk about too much here a bit um, with the ability to trace back and stuff, but like, yeah, the pseudonymity, um, it provides some privacy from surveillance where um, for a, un, an actor that doesn't really know exactly what they're doing, they may um, uh, look at it and it may be difficult for them to understand who's giving or receiving money here. Um, but on the other side, as we've talked about before, pseudonymous is not totally anonymous and with a bit of effort, and there's essentially companies that do this for regulators and things like that, they link these addresses to real identities um, as a way to, if they're trying to investigate drug trafficking or something like that. Um, let me say one other piece here, which I haven't said yet this class, but there's this great Martin Luther King Jr. quote that says, it is uh, not only, it is not only, it's our moral responsibility to disobey uh, sorry, to obey just laws, and it's also our moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Um, and that, you can kind of think about this whole world as uh, like the crypto anarchists saying, hey, we think we want to disobey some of these unjust laws, uh, and so we're going to do that with code. Um, so, yeah, so uh, so that I guess that's a way to, exactly what you're talking about, about here with the censorship resistance piece. It's like, it depends on kind of how just or unjust do you think the thing is? Um, yeah. Yeah, like um, the, one of the um, things that you had us read was the um, the assassination markets. Yeah. So like, how do you um, boycott an assassination market, or how do you like, you know, how do you that unstoppable code? Like, how is that? Yeah. Uh, how does Martin Luther King do anything about that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I think, yeah, and with these systems, uh, and like Arm was saying earlier, for any of them, if the code itself can be created and can be run and it will happen, then, and you really can't, you can start to attack, and we'll talk about this in a second, but there are other ways to attack it either, sometimes through the code itself, but also through, you can try to do some law-based things, or anybody who's found using the Ethereum you know, network is uh, goes to jail, or you can do it as a norm, where obviously if any of your friends start an assassination, make an assassination market, you like shame them, um, or you know, so stuff like that. Um, so there's this other one here, the social impacts and protocols. I think a lot of you talked about some of this, the, um, if you have this trustless and permissionless protocol, um, then yeah, it gives everybody more access. This kind of global reach here allows anybody to participate. That's sweet. Um, and but it's like, should everyone be allowed to participate? Um, this is a question like this humans in the loop question. A lot of people talk about this with AI, where it's like the AI is just running and it's doing its thing. Like, when do you want to loop a human into that system? And so that's similar here. It's like, should we allow the drug traffickers or whatever to participate in these? Uh, trustless permissionless systems. You, um, you do need internet access. You do need internet access. So it's not anyone. 
I totally. And we'll get to that, I think, in the next class where we talk about banking the unbanked um, and how that is a narrative that people say, but in fact may not be that true because it requires stuff like uh, internet access, smartphones, uh, understanding of the technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's this other piece here, which is this decrease in the, fran uh, the friction of transaction costs. Someone talked about that here, um, which is great. It's like, yay, technology. <laughs> um, and it can save us money. And it also can allow for new entrants. Uh, and this is kind of connected to the decentralization piece where you say, okay, if we kind of decrease the friction, democratize, that's what like a, you know, Silicon Valley type would say, you're democratizing, whatever. Um, and it allows for new people to come up. And that's good. But the issue is that if you decrease the friction of these things, um, it may be able to kind of save us money, but sometimes it's just these reinforcing feedback loops where something like the rich may get richer with the example we'll talk about again next class. Where it's like, if you want, if you think Bitcoin is a thing that you want to invest in and you have not very much money, then you can only invest a small amount of money. But if you have a lot, if you're Peter Thiel and you can invest a lot of money, then you do and you get a lot more money. Um, so that is kind of sad. And then the winners win more. This is an interesting one where, and this is connected to, again, this, this dichotomy with these, when you decrease transaction costs, it allows for lots and lots of like a thousand flowers to bloom and lots of different things to happen. And this happened in like the early internet times, but also that decrease of transaction costs um, allows the people who are doing really well, it allows them to aggregate a lot of the stuff towards them. Um, and so that, you can see that to some extent with the cryptocurrency world with like network effects and something like Bitcoin or what have you, where it's like if something's winning, um, then if it's low cost to you know join that thing, then that thing just continues to win more. Um, so yeah, the protocol thing is that tension, especially this humans in the loop tension. And then I would say the uh, decentralization piece, yeah, as we talked about, um, the ability to go around governments, but like who should we hold accountable in these systems, especially in these decentralized systems? Like if you're the, as we'll do in a second, this, um, if you're the regulators trying to regulate these things, who should you, should you regulate the miners or the nodes or who in the network should you regulate? Um, the, on the positive side, um, yeah, this is interesting where you can, and this is essentially what Tash was talking about, where um, these things are hard to understand but it also has kind of allowed for more experimentation than ever before. Like, you know, 20 years ago, there wasn't that many, there weren't that many people experimenting with new kinds of currencies in the world. Um, and now you have a lot of people experimenting with a lot of kinds of currencies, and that's pretty cool, because hopefully some of them may be okay. Um, but what that, what happened, the negative of that is this lack of coherence. And this is especially, you can really feel this when, so when you think about the internet, this was super true, where it's like, if you have lots of experimentation and then personalization, and then we all, instead of just like believing what the mainstream media used to tell us, now we have all of our personalized Twitter feeds or Facebook feeds. And so you have like a decreasing coherence as a, like a human organism around what is true or what isn't true. A similar thing is, will happen with, um, and is happening with cryptocurrencies, where you have a bunch of these new coins that are showing up. And instead of just being like, I use normal US dollars. <laughs> uh, instead, you have this lack of coherence around what money is and means and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I think the other piece here is this. Um, decentralization allows for what I would call like protection. So this is kind of the um, what Jason was talking about on the ability to um, give marginalized groups that one sees as just protection from the outside world. And this is kind of connected to the, uh, the piece about Gab, um, the reading, where it's like, okay, if you have a Gab or the uh, Lolicon, the, uh, the Japan um, child, like child pornography thing and drawings, um, those things are enabled through internet-based decentralization where you can create these new little sub-worlds that can kind of exist and in some ways you're like, oh, that's great that these sub-worlds can exist and that they can thrive in their own way, but they can become like self-referential and if you don't think that they are a good thing or whatever, um, then, then that's an issue. Um, yeah, so that is what I had as, and I want to do a little bit more of a discussion here around this third piece. So we've talked to some extent about understanding this complex system, especially from a technological perspective, where we say, what is this new technology? How does it work? 
That's what we just talked about. We talked about some of the impacts, positive and negative here, um, that it has on the world. And now we're going to say, okay, let's pretend that we uh, want to change something about this system. Uh, how would we do so? And uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about now and do uh, like an exercise. And this piece, by the way, is, um, there's a thing called uh, this man named Lawrence Lessig who has this thing called the Pathetic Dot Theorem. Uh, and it came out at the early uh, internet times with uh, Creative Commons and copyright. And he was thinking about how to enact change in these systems. Um, and so uh, the, his Pathetic Dot is essentially equal to this. It's these four different forces that we can think about here where if you want to change something, or when you're just trying to understand how something is, is um, being, uh, if you're trying to understand the system, you can think about the technology uh, aspect, you can think about the economics or like the incentives of the system, the market, you can think about like the policy piece or the laws, um, or you can think about like the culture and the norms. So those are kind of like, when you're thinking about doing something, kind of bucket it into those big four categories. Um, and right now, what we're primarily gonna do is we're gonna battle um, mostly like the technology piece, aka this new technology is coming out, versus like the law or policy piece. Um, so, in order to do that, um, we're gonna do this cat and mouse game. Uh, and so, we're gonna get into groups again, and we'll, we'll switch them up this time for fun. Um, and one side will be like the regulator, cool. so they are trying to stop these things from happening. And then the other side is like the crypto anarchist, or you could call it um, the, the developers, or some, some piece that's building the code. They're trying to continue what they're doing. Um, and for each of them, you can start to kind of ask, um, so what, you're gonna break it into those two groups, and then the regulators will start to say stuff like, okay, uh, in this immutable distributed database, maybe I wanna to try to reverse the transactions and try to think, okay, how can I do that? Is there a way for me to like reverse these transactions? Or um, on the cryptography piece, man, is, is there a way that I can actually spend these coins with the private key or like get the coins from you? Or is there a way that I can de you know, de anonymize these pseudonymous transactions, um, maybe at the Bitcoin layer, maybe at the networking layer, where can I um, you know, de anonymize these things? Or from like a protocol and decentralization perspective, um, is there, where can I insert permissions or trust into the system so that I as a regulator can like actively engage here? Um, and then where uh, can you add, or where, as I, as, where can I as a regulator add centralization like back to the system um, to, you know, to insert myself or those permissions or the trust? So this is the, and as you'll, so, so the regulators will be starting to think about this stuff. And I, I kind of imagine it's like, there's a transaction that's happening or you're trying to, um, they're trying to do Bitcoin transactions. The regulator is like, okay, I'm going to do this to you. And they'll say something like, I'm gonna de-anonymize you by doing blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the other person will be like, okay, well, the, what we respond by doing this, because it's really, it's this cat and mouse game where you can kind of, um, as the regulators are trying to do things, then the um, crypto anarchists or whatever might have ways to get around that. Um, so does this uh, make sense as, a, as an exercise? Yes. Um, okay, so let's... Um, I, I might, let me just add one thing. Yes. You can't just sort of say, I'm passing a law that says that you could never do this thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, try to think about what's actually feasible or you know might make sense in today's world, and not immediately go for a nuclear option. And if you did that, then there are, and I would, I would respond yeah, with the, uh, I would yes, say, yes, I could do, true, true, yeah, true, in which true, nation state true. jurisdiction, you know. Um, yeah. So, uh, so this is what we're gonna. So, yeah. so let's have, and we're gonna switch group. And nothing else. I heard a lot of um, <laughs> the regulators. Everybody was kind of helping each other out, kind of, or like the regulators would be like, oh, you could do this, or you could do that, and, like, and then like, and then the on the other side, I was like, oh, but we can dodge in this way, or we can like dodge in that way. Um, so just to check from folks, did anybody have any ways to reverse transactions? They resisted. They just they just said reversing. We don't want to reverse. <laughs> and we're not allowed to give them the nuclear no, no, option. Saying it's, it's, you bloody it's, have to yeah. reverse. It's a feature. Yeah. 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 I do think that this one reversing transactions is very very hard. 
it's very, very hard in these systems. You have to, um, in order to reverse a transaction, you'd have to, what's called like 51%, um, you'd have to 51% attack one of these networks, which means you get a bunch of mining equipment, buy a bunch of mining equipment, more than exists, um, now, like twice as much as exists now, uh, or it's such a, the amount that exists now plus one, um, and uh, get all that mining equipment and then use all that mining equipment to create new blocks on the blockchain um, and or reverse some of the old blocks on the blockchain because you have all of the mining equipment. Um, if you can't do that, then it's very difficult. Like if I've already sent Neha my money, there's no, and you come to me and you say reverse the transaction, it's like, I, 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 sorry, Neha slash Iran or whatever people are talking about, yeah. um, they already have the money, so I can't. Um, so that's tough. This spending coins with a private key, this one's also real tough. So, um, so I'm going to propose the other notion of reverse transaction, mm -hmm. which is demand that this account send this other account this amount of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, that's a good idea. So, which is instead of reversing the transaction by buying um, the, a ton of Bitcoin miners and rewriting the blockchain, instead what you can do is say, "Hey, you sent Iran this money. Now we want Iran to send that money back to you." Um, which, depending on who it is, it could be a lot easier. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think you raise the coin. Of what if you send it into the void? Into the void, yeah. <laughs> you can send things to the null, I, at least in the theory, you can send things to the null address, uh, which is where the, just money goes to die. Um, and so you can't reverse it. So sorry, Grandma. Um, uh, <laughs> can you spend coins with a private key? This one, again, is very difficult um, because private key cryptography, um, it has these mathematical guarantees. So it's like, if you're like, okay, I want to get you know, if I'm a terrorist or something like that, and like I want to get my money and spend my coins with the private key, you essentially have to extort me or like you know kidnap me or whatever, and like get me to tell you the private key, or you can like get my computer and get maybe my last pass password. That's what you would do if you were me. Um, and <laughs> hello, people on the internet who are watching this later. Um, uh, and uh, you could do that, or you could do what Tash said, which is like eventually things like quantum computers may start to break some of this cryptography that we have. Uh, so that's for that one. Um, De-anonymizing the stuff. This one's a lot easier, all things considered, which is, again, there are a bunch of companies that already do this that have you know raised lots of venture capital funding and things. Um, and you can de-anonymize these transactions either at the actual like um, Bitcoin layer itself where you say, okay, uh, I noticed that a bunch of these transactions all came from the same account and like that account was doing these things before or whatever. Um, but you can then start to connect it back to the networking layer as well. So you can say, oh, this IP address um, is only, is, is, we can connect this IP address to like these cookies that are on the, um, Sorry, let me say it more clearly. You can connect um, various parts of non-blockchain activity to the blockchain in order to connect the two. So for example, if I always send my money in Eastern Standard Time, then that will be a part of, of how to de-anonymize uh, those transactions. Um, then there's this piece about inserting permissions and trust. Yeah, I think this is Primarily the piece that I kind of ignored when I was trying to send uh, WikiLeaks money or when they were trying to get out their money, which are what people in cryptocurrency call on-ramps and off-ramps. It's how you get your US dollars or your other nation-state currency into cryptocurrency and then it goes in cryptocurrency land, wherever it goes, and then eventually you get it out of cryptocurrency land. Um, so that's the on-ramp and then the off-ramp. Uh, and so you can make a bunch of rules around those on-ramps and off-ramps. You can make it the case that um, people have to do KYC or know your customer or things like that uh, in these systems that only if someone starts to get money here, then you have to know, they have to have shown their driver's license and passport or whatever, so you know, um, so you can make that connection between their pseudonymous transactions and uh, their real life IDs. Um, yeah, and then adding centralization back to the system, this is always a balance in these systems where you can imagine regulators or regulator-like things trying to make, um, yeah, trying to uh, essentially finding the points of centralization and or adding them themselves and then starting to regulate them. So like a point of centralization in the cryptocurrency ecosystem are to some extent these exchanges where there are only so many big exchanges and so you can find them and start to say, okay, those exchanges, I want to regulate them. Or you can start to say, ah, oh, let's try to create 
um, points of centralization and regulate them. So that's kind of what that looks like. Um, let's have everybody, or any other final thoughts or questions on this or comments? Uh, any other fun things that people will chat about? We need a different interpretation of how to add centralization back to the system. Mm -hmm. So what our regulators did was they started seizing some of the bigger mining nodes. Yeah. So they could um, have uh, like 51%. Yeah, that makes sense. Or partitioning. Did you go into specifics around that? Like, you know, what was it an American regulator or a Chinese regulator, or was it like a you know unilateral deal and trade war and you know all of that stuff? Or um, we China. Yeah. Well, when we show them map, it looked like there were a lot of big nodes in Sichuan, so maybe China would want to just gut those nodes and then would only need like a little more power and money on their side to maybe take fifty one percent. Yeah, I agree. That's a good way to add. So, so just one point about a regulator, because it's, a regulator is not real in real life, is not really engaged in an ethics argument, what is good and bad, right? They're trying to enforce certain rules on the books, and they have a particular political angle, and they're politically appointed usually, and so it's, it's a very different game than just arguing what is good and bad, essentially. Yeah, I agree. I think that, yeah, definitely, and yeah, obviously, most of these regulators, um, and we'll talk about this in the next class as well, is that there's, uh, yeah, they're, they're trying to just um, regulate with respect to a certain law in their jurisdiction, um, and there, I think, similar cat and mouse games start to happen as well when the regulators produce new, new laws and or try to regulate them based off law, but yeah, they're not, they're, they're just doing things with respect to law. Oh, in these final five minutes, uh, what I want to do is... Uh, wrap up with some final thoughts on, on this kind of stuff and then talk about uh, next week. So the final thoughts are just um, a key mindset uh, that was in the readings I just want to reemphasize here is this privacy versus security mindset. And uh, these words, they kind of look similar sometimes um, in that they have Y's at the end. Uh, the <laughs> privacy usually, and again, there's no correct depth, but it's like, it's usually when people are talking about, it's usually this mathematical guarantee where you say, okay, I have um, something that is that other people cannot have, and I have some kind of you know mathematical guarantee such that others cannot uh, get into, uh, cannot find my, my private stuff. And that's different than what some people talk about as security often, which is, um, well, A, when people in the blockchain world are talking about security, they're often talking about um, something like these 51% attacks and like making sure that the network itself is secure and what the network being secure means is that um, the system will run as intended without people being able to attack it uh, with mining power or in other kinds of ways. Um, but when most people talk about this privacy versus security thing, it's they're talking about security from like a um, like a public safety perspective. So these are people um, that are thinking from a you know like a cybersecurity or what have you perspective. They're more likely to be uh, like in the, the government or something like that, and they're saying, hey, let's make sure that there's that public safety from bad actors that we have that that we are have security uh, as a like a populace. Um, so when you have this privacy versus security debate, that is. That debate is shown in that Philip Rogaway post, the moral character of cryptographic work, um, around that's what this that's this law enforcement framing. So that's one that you'll hear a lot, which is, hey, um, there are, I want this right to privacy, and privacy is this individual good, and having privacy is really good, and we have to balance that versus this more collective good, which is security. Um, and so that's what they mean by the law enforcement framing and that privacy versus security debate. There's a lot of nuance to that debate and how it um, is true and or not true, but that's essentially the law enforcement framing. Then there's the surveillance studies framing, which is more about um, power instead of thinking about these like different rights. And it's saying, okay, if I am, uh, yeah, it's, it's thinking about I as an individual versus like the state as an entity and how the state can surveil me and how the state, if they have lots of surveillance, then it might you know, make the uh, free thought and free expression, um, they might kind of mute that uh, if, if it's a surveillance state. 
And so it's more, and this is again, like more of like a crypto anarchist frame, you could say, um, but it's also as part of more general kind of tech ethics, surveillance capitalism kind of stuff. So those are just like these two big framings to be aware of as you think about the tech ethics side of things. I think that there are uh, one piece that I want to say, which is, or just to run through these really quick, which is the, I think it's another important distinction is this, so unstoppable code is what we've mostly been talking about today, and that is about how when you, it's like censorship resistance, and that the decentralization, the protocol-ness of the network allows you to, to create um, code and for these transactions to run through, and that's a little bit different but connected to this autonomous code, and autonomous code is usually talked about around like artificial intelligence and automating decisions or things, but in this context, you can think about it as these smart contracts, which are these um, pieces of code that will automatically run on the blockchain. And so that's different than what we've been talking about most of today, which is like the code, like me actively signing something with my private key and sending it to someone else versus creating a smart contract, having that smart contract live on the blockchain and then that autonomous code running. Yep. Would autonomous code be under the unstoppable code umbrella? I think it would be because uh, autonomous code is built on top of the could unstoppable I, could code. I, could I uh, yes. answer that? It, yeah. it might be, but it might not. I would say it might be, but it might not be. And also, we're kind of making this up as it goes. So, you know, we're working <laughs> this up. But, but, um, but uh, yeah, maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. So, no, so, no, definitely. Oh, 100%. So, 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 so when I think of autonomous code, what I think of is I write a smart contract, I upload it, and then I, you know, go to sleep for a hundred years. That that code doesn't need me. It's going to keep running. It's going to keep processing. It's going to keep doing what it's doing. Whether or not that code is stoppable depends on how I programmed it. It might be the case that there's a kill switch that you know mm. someone with the right private key can turn it off, okay. right? So, um, so in that sense, you know, I would I wouldn't put one under the other. They're sort of like yeah, mm -hmm. two different things. Yeah, yeah. good. Um, there's one thing that we didn't talk about much today is this the privacy coin aspect, but that's another, we talk about cryptography and how it gives you the private key ability and how it creates these pseudonymous transactions. But there's a whole other piece around these privacy coins, something like Zcash, if you've heard of that, which allows you to transact much more privately. So instead of the blockchain saying like, oh, it went from blah, blah, blah to blah, 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 it, it, it just says, Transactions happened, and the, the total like sum in the system was the same. Um, so that's kind of yeah, which is crazy. So that's um, some of these privacy coins. Also, when you view tech ethics in general, another place to view it from is from the view of diversity and inclusion. We were starting to hit on this earlier, but like so, ninety-five percent of open source blockchain commits are from men, um, and so there are it's a cis at the intersection of tech and finance. Um, it's a lot of. Uh, a lot of men, a lot of white men, a lot of white men in developed countries and that kind of thing. And so um, that's another very powerful perspective to bring. Um, and the final one is this tech ethics from the view of like externalization and dehumanization. So you can see this in Amazon, uh, something like Amazon is an easy example of this where, um, or actually maybe Facebook is uh, an easier example where you have Facebook, you have this new massive platform and they have to have people moderate it. Um, and these moderators, they have tens, 10,000, 20,000 of these people who just have to look at really intense comments that have been flagged all day. Um, and we don't really experience that. We just get our normal Facebook experience. And that has been, that idea has been kind of externalized and it's kind of like, it, you know, we're, con we're deconnected from the human aspect of things. And so that is another way to kind of view this ecosystem.